Okay, so this is on Zinc, which is a new crypto API for kernel that is uh, less of an API and more of a collection of <coughs> functions. Uh, so let's jump in. Um, background, I'm Jason. Um, my background is mostly in uh, exploitation, uh, kernel bones, uh, crypto bones. Um, doing a lot of kernel related development, uh, crypto related development for a long time. Um, and for the last couple of years, I've been working on WireGuard. Uh, there's a presentation on tomorrow, which is uh, an internal VPN protocol that has motivated this API. Um, so just a quick overview before you jump into Zinc. WireGuard is supposed to be less than 4,000 lines of code, easily implemented with basic data structures. Um, WireGuard itself is, is supposed to be easily implementable uh, using uh, obvious clear coding patterns. Uh, we want minimal state. We don't want to make any dynamic memory allocations. Uh, it's supposed to be stealthy, have a minimal attack surface. And so the question for the crypto is, um, can we achieve WireGuard security objectives uh, and, and simplicity objectives using the current day crypto API? Um, uh, and uh, I found it wasn't possible, which is why we have this. So um, just to kind of show a, a, a case study of some problems ran into with the current crypto API before we look into uh, how the new one works, um, let's look at bigkey.c. Um, so I was kind of randomly perusing the kernel a while ago and um, ran into this file, bigkey.c, and it had like a million bugs of, of you know, really novice so the, um, the basic idea is it's supposed to store a key uh, um, in memory, but then encrypt some data on disk using that key. Um, so I guess it's if you want to store like really massive key in the kernel's key ring, but you don't want to fit that all in RAM, and so you can write out the ciphertext to disk and then store an encryption key somewhere in RAM. Um, not a very complicated idea, but uh, the original crypto I was using was totally broken. It used like ECB mode. Um, uh, so like there's the Linux Penguin and then there's the Linux Penguin encrypted using <coughs> ECB mode and it's still a Penguin obviously. Um, if there wasn't any authentication, so you could modify the contents of the ciphertext on, on disk and it would be undetectable. Um, it didn't use randomness in, in the right way, uh, so keys were probably predictable too. Um, it reused keys across encryption in an unsafe way. Uh, it didn't like zero keys out. I mean, it was just like a, a disaster. Lots of CVEs. Um, and so I thought like, okay, great. Here's something that's really, you know, kind of messed up. And now I can rewrite it using the old crypto API. And then maybe I'll learn how that API works well enough that I can, uh, I can use it in WireGuard. So I did the best I could in rewriting this with the crypto API. Um, so let, let's see what that looked like. Um, so the first thing we got to do is define um, the cipher we're going to be using. Um, so in this case, uh, we use uh, AESGCM, and uh, we have to allocate that. And so you'll notice um, it's got this uh, this like crazy descriptor. It's got like a domain-specific language for just specifying which one you want, and you know, like construct it into arbitrary complexity, um, which is a bit ridiculous. The, this here, it says async. Confusingly, that's actually a flag that says, we don't want it to be async. Uh, it, it's a mask, I guess, but okay, that's, that's kind of crazy. Um, and then we have to set the size of the authentic authentication tag after we've allocated. Um, okay, so then when it comes time to actually encrypt, um, we have to allocate another object uh, for the actual encryption request. Um, so uh, this is not good for um, uh, for WireGuard because we don't want to be allocating memory ever in response to packets. Um, uh, and in, in general, I mean, you know, this is slow. It's not, it's not something that would want to happen. Um, it uses all scatter gather lists, uh, which means that we uh, we can't encrypt things that are on the stack. We can't encrypt uh, VM alloc addresses, um, which makes things really cumbersome. Um, so, okay, so we, we uh, so yeah, we allocate the thing, then we can set up this scatter gather list kind of clumsily. We can 
set crypts where we pass this in, um, and we tell it that the additional data has a length of zero. If this was positive, that would mean the additional data is like part of what we tell it to crypt, which is also confusing. And then it's all callback based. So then um, uh, usually we'd get the callback here, but because we specified that it's not asynchronous earlier, then we just have to call back to null, which is like further confusing. Um, uh, so then this is the part that, that really is uh, a hindrance, which is that the key is not attached to the request object we just allocated. It's attached to the instance of the actual cipher. Um, so uh, that means if we only have one instance of the actual cipher, we have to have a lock around just using it. Uh, if like another thread wants to do it too. Or we'd have to have like per CPU pools of this or allocate a new one every time we wanted it. Um, and, and so for something like WireGuard, where we have like tons of different keys happening from all over the place all the time. Uh, there's a lot of forward secrecy and that kind of thing. Uh, this does not uh, work well at all. Um, and you know, so it's just like more complicated locking and freeing and so forth. Um, uh, so okay, the, the, this all worked pretty well. Uh, there's a problem. Um, that big key likes to malloc uh, around a megabyte worth of, uh, worth of data. And uh, some systems, you just can't malloc a megabyte, um, which is fine. Uh, so usually the solution is if you need to that big of array use like KV alloc. Uh, so it'll try to K malloc, and if it can't, then it'll VM malloc and you know, use, the, um, uh, use the VM to kind of to shovel the different pages together. Uh, but we can't with Crypto API because you can't uh, encrypt VM malloc pages. So, um, Dave Howells smartly noticed this and um, and and fixed it um, uh, by writing a new allocator um, <laughs> just for bigkey.c. And like, okay, this is good code. You know, it's like really clean and confidently done, and uh, it does it the right way. You know, uh, you, you can't do it better than this. Um, but like, really, I mean, we're just trying to like encrypt a little buffer for some random like encrypted key driver. But yeah, so he, you know, first he has to like K malloc, like uh, the, the buffer for the metadata and, and whatnot. Um, and then he can get the individual pages and then he can vmap those. Uh, this is crazy. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool and all, but uh, like it's, it's really just uh, all, all this trouble to encrypt a buffer with the most common authenticated encryption scheme. Um, yet we have to allocate you know, once per encryption, once per key. Uh, we can't use stack addresses, VM malloc addresses. There's this crazy string parsing thing to even specify what cipher we want, um, which kind of points toward infinite, dangerous uh, algorithm agility. Um, and in general, this is like a really crazy you know, enterprise API uh, that's prone to failure and misuse. Um, it it kind of resembles the old school 132 crypto API. Um, I guess they came around the same area, uh, same era. And it, it, it's, it's hard to use. Um, so uh, for Zinc, I wound up fixing this. Um, I, I, I ported this to Zinc, and the, the disk stats like this, I removed 206 lines and added 28. Um, I think the file itself is only like 600 lines. You know, it's. It, it really simplifies things because we don't have to do this crazy dance. Um, so the zinc uh, solution is like we uh, we like allocate the buffer where the encrypted data is going to go. Uh, um, we have like a, a buffer for the key uh, because I guess like the way the big keys work is you attach these buffers to like inodes and stuff uh, for keys. Um, we get the the. the random key. So this all here is like non-zinc. It's just kind of the thing that the key wants to do. And then the one called a zinc is that line in the bottom where we just say encrypt. Bam. Done. And it does it. Because um, most cryptography is like pure C. It's just functions. It, you take some bytes in and you do a bunch of operations to it. And then you put it in another buffer of bytes. Like it, a lot of crypto is not um, you know, particularly kernel code uh, with just kind of these pure transformations. So the actual code of Zinc is really simple. Um, 
encrypt the buffer, we pass it, you know, no additional data, but we have a key, um, and it does it. And uh, so the emphasis of, of Zinc is, is to be not really more complicated than this. Um, uh, there, there's not a lot of innovation here. It's like we have this really complicated, amazing crypto API that does a million of things, but what about just um, straightforward, synchronous, software-based uh, crypto? Um, the current crypto API needs that. You know, it can do accelerators and all, all, all that crazy stuff, but ultimately it needs the software implementations. And so it'd be nice to have really accessible ones to the bazillion places in the kernel that just want simple software-based crypto. Um, so Zinc is functions. Um, it's, it's, that's all it is. Um, uh, I mean, the, the innovation <coughs> is realizing that crypto doesn't need to be uh, more complicated just for the software aspect. Um, so to start with, for the initial submission, um, we have the primitives that WireGuard uses. Um, and then after, we're going to start expanding out to the other primitives that are used in a bunch of places in the kernel. Um, there are many parts of the kernel that, um, that do use the crazy, like infinitely agile um, uh, set of algorithms, uh, you know, like uh, IPsec, and you can like compose it in crazy ways. But um, uh, there are probably more parts of the kernel that are using crypto algorithms that set this, like, I don't want async flag and want things just to be in software and synchronous and, and quick and, and kind of boring. Um, and so I think I gradually will be going through and adding whatever those are using to Zinc so that they can, they can benefit from the simplicity. So we have the cha cha 20 string cipher and the quality 1 through 5 uh, one time Mac that you can uh, compose these together to get the cha poly AAD construction. Um, Blake 2 is a, is a really fast hash function. Uh, that that's works great on all hardware. Um, we have curve to 519 for different um, So it's, it's, I mean, it's what Wiregard <coughs> uses, um, but uh, it's actually kind of a neat uh, breath to start with because it handles a lot of different things. We have like, uh, you know, encryption, macking, hashing, uh, hash macking. Uh, we've got some public key crypto. I mean, it, it, it's a good sampling of how the API will work. Um, so, okay, here's a real world example from, from WireGuard of what hashing looks like. So you can do it in one shot um, uh, where you just call it with the, with the input buffer and output buffer. Or in, in classic fashion, there's like the init to get it started and then you update it as you feed data into the hash function and then final to get the actual hash out of it. Um, this pattern is uh, not new uh, nor, nor innovative, it's how hash functions work in basically every crypto library. And uh, finally, people can do the same basic thing here. Um, and, and so we're, we're going for kind of well-established conventions, uh, things people are used to that uh, are easy to understand, easy to read. Um, <laughs> this is kind of a funny thing I counted. This is another one of these crazy strings for the old crypto APIs. So it's like don't make any specific language. So like we're not going to have this. I mean, if you want dynamic dispatch, you can implement that, or you can use the existing crypto API that can then call into Zinc for a software-based uh, algorithms. But like, uh, for the most part, people want one specific algorithm because they're implementing a driver that does a particular thing. Um, and so <laughs> we don't want to be parsing this in the, in the kernel, so we just have functions. Um, and, and so the initial patch that actually goes through for uh, ChaCha and Poly, which are in the current crypto API, and it replaces um, their uh, software implementations with just a call out to Zinc. Um, uh, and uh, it was really simple to do. At, at first in the patch set, it's kind of hesitant because I didn't want the submission to blow up and get too big. And then it's, no, no, we really want to see what this looks like. And so I did it, and then it actually you know, it took 15 minutes and it was, I threw away a bunch of code and then the crypto API was just calling one function to do the encryption and zinc. So that was really simple. Um, there's also a lot of crypto code in lib. Um, there's just like some hash functions, even ChaCha20 has implementation there. Um, uh, half MD4 used to be there before I moved it uh, into the file system stuff. Um, uh, there's like SHA in there. So there's a bunch of stuff in lib already. 
because developers want to be using just functions to call crypto. And so in this kind of willy-nilly, haphazard way, it's crept in there and it's not really well curated or, uh, or, or well organized. And so uh, with Zinc, we'll be moving the stuff that's just kind of spread out all over the place in lib into lib slash zinc um, and kind of uh, centralizing and or organizing the way we, we approach that. Yeah. But it's clear that developers want just normal functions in a lot of cases. Um, and, and so it, it's, I imagine <laughs> developers have thought like, well, should I mess around with the crypto API and figure out how that works or should I mess around with stealing this out and throwing it into lib? Like what will be the least amount of work? And the different developers have decided different things and now we have this kind of mess there. So we're gonna be cleaning that up. Um, uh, the, the current crypto API is also kind of like a museum of different primitives and implementations. I mean, who, who wrote these? Are they good? Have they been verified? Where do they come from? Um, does anyone in the cryptographic community actually care about the kernel and can deal with the kernel enough to even be auditing our stuff? Um, so I, I, I think there's reason for significant doubt about the, the strength of the implementations in, in the crypto API. Um, Things are proposed to be added to it now and are, are usually accepted without much review. Um, uh, it's like a, a bunch of new stuff that just went in of like, you know, like cutting edge ciphers that uh, I guess someone wanted in there and that were filled with bugs. And I mean, there, there, there hasn't been a lot of uh, scrutiny to the actual implementations, which makes me nervous too. Um, so Zing's approach for order of preference is in order um, We'd like formally verified code uh, whenever that's available, and we'll get into what that means in a second. Um, if that's not available, then usually we go for widespread usage, um, code that's received a lot of scrutiny. So for the case of the, the ciphers for wire that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, that's Andy Polikov's implementations. A Andy Polikov is uh, this, this uh, genius who writes optimized implementations for every architecture um, that make their way into OpenSSL, and so they have tons of eyeballs trying to break these. I mean, the, if you break his, then this, that's kind of like the holy grail for being a security researcher with crypto. Um, so they've received eyeballs. And they're also uh, the fastest for the most part. Um, and, and so things from that category uh, we generally prefer. And then if that's not available, um, implementations that stem from the reference implementation are, and that are kind of obviously correct, and nothing too fancy. Um, So for, for Chacha 20, we have uh, like all the Intel extensions. Uh, we have R32, R64, uh, the Neon for that. We have a MIPS32 R2 extension uh, uh, implementation so that it's, uh, it's fast on the little routers. Um, similar story for Poly 135, except we also have MIPS64 for that. Um, for Blake, we've got the uh, fast Intel. Um, for Curve 25519, we have uh, our Neon. Um, and uh, using some extensions of, uh, of Intel Scalar instructions, which are cool. Um, in general, the implementations we've chosen are super high speed in, in addition to being really well vetted. Um, they, they beat the current crypto APIs ones by a long shot and uh, are, are generally at the, at the front. Uh, okay, so what's the deal with formal verification? Um, there are two uh, important projects for that. Um, one is called Hacklestar, and one is called Fiat Crypto. Um, uh, Hacklestar comes out of uh, Inria in France, uh, uses a language called F-Star, and uh, Fiat Crypto comes out of MIT um, and, uh, and uses uh, like the original mathematical uh, logic system called Koch to, to formulate these proofs. Uh, and the result is, um, is machine-generated C that's actually readable, that looks like normal C that you can modify if you wanted. Um, that's not really a build artifact because it looks like C you might have written. Um, and so the general idea is you first define a model in, in F-star or, or one of these systems um, that says what the algorithm is supposed to do mathematically. So like if you have a curve, here's the structure of the curve, and here's what a multiplication the curve is supposed to look like. Um, and then you make another model that um, gives kind of the implementation mechanics. And then F star will prove that the mathematical model and the implementation mechanics model are equivalent. Um, and then it can lower down the implementation model 
uh, into C, um, or uh, now even with uh, with hack and start into into WebAssembly, or I mean, they can target a bunch of different things. Um, it's not so much a compiler as it is like a, a, a it applies transforms, um, and and so. Um, uh, we've been working with the, the Hack of Star guys to uh, generate code that looks pretty for the kernel because uh, they've got you know a different style and all that kind of uh, trivial stuff. Um, so of course, formal verification is not the end-all, be-all, but it's much less likely to have uh, big crypto vulnerabilities, um, uh, especially if you're doing like a big integer arithmetic, like on curves or uh, poly one through five, for example. Um, it can be certain that it's not missing any carry chains or uh, overflows or things like that. It has a very precise model of uh, the C language. Um, uh, it's from the same institute that did uh, CompCert, for example, to, to verify C compiler. So they, I mean, they, they know what they're doing with this stuff. Um, in, in general, Zinc uh, strives to have uh, stronger relations with academia. Um, people who are designing these crypto primitives uh, are really smart. Um, uh, have a lot of implementation knowledge, uh, are incredible engineers in addition to, to being academics. I mean, some academics are up in the clouds and can't really write code or use computers well, even though they're you know, in the field. But uh, others are really uh, amazing implementers. Um, you know, uh, guys like uh, Dan Bernstein, for example, that uh, you know, put out good implementations in addition to coming up with the, um, with the primitives. Uh, but uh, a lot of these guys don't really come near the kernel because we've got this weird esoteric approach and it's like hard to find things in the tree and uh, the current API is very unfriendly. It's like not a place that's attracting the smart people who would otherwise want to work on this. Um, and, and so the goal is to make uh, Zinc and, and kernel crypto actually attractive uh, to the best minds out there um, so that we can have these uh, you know, hordes of postdocs uh, eager to work on the kernel for us. Um, in fact, uh, several academics have already kind of expressed interest in, in working on this. Um, uh, the kernel has a high level of impact, so just to being the kernel alone is appealing, but then actually having a way in which they can contribute uh, that isn't too insane uh, makes it possible. Um, that said, uh, you know, Zinc is uh, fundamentally an engineering project, not an academic project. Uh, but I think it's important to have the crossover, to have the additional eyeballs and additional uh, attention that academic cryptographers can give. Um, all implementations are also heavily fuzzed. Um, and I, I like to think of this as kind of a, uh, a requirement for, uh, for contributions in the tree, where submitting something, you you got to fuzz it for a while. Um, fuzzing doesn't find everything, of course, but it finds a lot of really obvious, obvious things. And it's so easy to make a fuzzer with something like uh, uh, with the buzzer from LLVM. So here, like here's an example of, of how one would work. Um, you define this function LLVM fuzzer test one input, which gives you an input and a length. Um, and so the goal here is to show that like these three functions are equivalent to each other or producing the same results. And so first I copy the input into a bunch of independent buffers, then I compute these functions, and then I crash if it doesn't produce the same result. Really simple. I throw this into, into the LLVM fuzzer stuff, and then it tries a bunch of inputs, and I, it'll do it in multiple cores, so I'll, I'll put this on a, a big heavy box somewhere. Um, and uh, if there's a really obvious bug, um, it'll find it immediately. If there's a more subtle one, maybe take a day or something. But I mean, it's so easy to write this kind of thing that uh, there's really no reason not to for, for submitting this kind of stuff. <coughs> um, and in general, by uh, choosing implementations that are well known or broadly used, we, um, we benefit from the analysis that people are already doing. Um, so I mentioned hey, Polyakov's CryptoGAN stuff that's used in OpenSSL. <coughs> okay, so the organization. So um, this is going to live in lib slash zinc and then the name of the cipher. Um, so for cha-cha, it's in lib zinc, cha-cha, and then we have the generic C1, you know, the ARM one, the x86 one, and so forth. Um, and so when we group it by primitive, it makes it really easy to co open it up and see what's there, see what's not there, see what uh, could be added. Uh, it's kind of like just a really friendly, straightforward approach. Um, 
how does the kernel implement cha cha 20? And then you just open up the cha cha 20 directory and you see it. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it makes the whole thing a lot more manageable. Um, it also allows us to put the glue code uh, right next to the implementations um, uh, in a way that makes uh, things really fast via compiler inlining. Um, and so rather than using lots of function pointers and dynamic module loading for this kind of stuff, um, uh, we can use branches that get predicted out. So I'll show you that in a second. Um, but the end result of this is we don't have any slowdowns because of uh, Reptiline. Um, okay, so compiler inlining. Here's an example. Um, for the poly 1 through 5 emit function, first we try with the arc function, like if there's an optimized implementation. Um, and uh, if there is, then that's real code. Otherwise, it's a predefined stub that returns false. And so that branch is compiled out uh, and we only hit the generic one. Um, uh, here's another example where um, in that arc function, uh, you know, we have capabilities. Does the processor have neon? Are we going to use it? Um, you know, this needs to be checked because it's part of the runtime logic. But this is set uh, pretty much at module init time. It never changes, but actually on, on all architectures, um, the branch predictor is super, super good at this kind of stuff. Uh, variable that's set once, never touched again. Um, it always predicts right in these cases. Um, and so it turns out rather than like crazy function pointer stuff um, and making everything really dynamic, uh, which is now you know, slow because all, all the spectrum mitigation stuff, um, the simple branch is both straightforward to read uh, and winds up being really fast. Um, it, it also sets things up uh, as you know nice future stuff if people do want to work on the dynamic patching. And I think there's like a patch from Intel for uh, more kind of dynamically patched branches. Um, but um, on every architecture, I saw that things like this were predicted correctly every time. Um, there's, we also do uh, some optimizations to the, the SIMD uh, context. So um, traditionally in the kernel, uh, when you do crypto, you have to call uh, this kernel after you begin and kernel after you end. Um, that uh, calls X save so that if the if user space is using any of the FPU registers, well, we don't, it doesn't trample on it. If you forget to do this, um, a random program in user space will probably crash. It's using like uh, AVX accelerated memcopy or something. It's kind of a funny bug to play with. Um, so Traditionally, you have to call begin and end, and then you do your stuff in the middle, and you're supposed to keep these segments rather short. Um, uh, and calling curl fpu end uh, is, is currently slow, uh, because every time you do a begin and end, you're calling xsave uh, back and forth. Um, and especially on Intel, not there's AVX512, you have these registers that are massive, and so you have this like, huge state that has to be xsave uh, but this winds up being really expensive. And so if you're encrypting things over and over, um, like in a, in a worker thread where you're just taking things off a queue and encrypting it, um, you find that a lot of the overhead is not the actual crypto, which is usually expensive, but just this stupid X save, X restore situation. Um, uh, so yeah, so like for a loop like this, if you have the package of the loop, then you're, you know, you do all this needless uh, X saving. Um, so the solution is uh, to do batching, where we can hoist out the SIMD context, where uh, we have variable. Uh, we have this variable SIMD context, and we can get it, and we can put it. And uh, the, the get will, uh, will, will begin the FPU, and the put will end it. Um, and then in the middle, we can call relax. Um, on, on some architectures, taking uh, Taking the FPU means disabling uh, preemption, which is bad. Um, uh, but we don't always want to re-enable it by calling SIMD put. Uh, so SIMD relax will do a get put only if necessary, only if uh, we've been going too long. Um, and it's a fami familiar get put paradigm. Um, makes the code very simple uh, to kind of hoist that out. Uh, and the performance increase is uh, very significant. Uh, I hope we already had lady safe restore from not not quite. It still does something. So there's a patch set now that's working on making um, 
end, basically a uh, no-op, and having the actual uh, restore happen at context switch time. And uh, if that lands, that'll be great. Then we can get rid of this. Um, I think we have this on R64. So the app is not to restore anything. I've had Power PC too. I've had Power PC had it for a long time. Oh, huh, okay. It, it, it might be possible other, others are doing it. On x86, it's, it's not the case, though. But I'm sure it still happens in x86, because yeah. if you use it in a book refresh in your current copy, then store and save is not already. If you use the what? If you are in the current refresh, and then use a current view begin and it's an end, it, that's not for current refresh. For current refresh? Sure. No. It is, because um, FPU initializes zero for current refresh. And for that reason, you don't do save and restore. Uh, but not for what? I for really don't think yes, so. Because in current thread, you don't have user context. You never use FPU in the you, first place. You, you do. I mean, the scheduler is switching between a, a user it on that core and your K thread on that same core. Yes, so it saves the, a few registers for the user, uh, for the user thread. No, it, it doesn't. That's, it th that's the whole idea, is that X save is expensive. And so if the kernel isn't going to use it, there's no point in X saving. So on context switch, it doesn't X save. Thing. When we had a lazy FPU, then we got eager FPU when we did it always. And then we got rid of eager FPU and always save and restore, except for kernel threads. So if you have a context switch from a user task into a worker thread, for instance, you save the task uh, FPU context, but you didn't uh, restore anything for the current thread. So you're saying there's only contention between kernel threads then? User. So if you have a context switch between user task and user task, you save and restore. But if you have a context switch between K thread and a K thread, you don't do anything at all. What about between a user and a K thread? Then you save the user, but you don't restore anything. But what if you have two K threads? I don't think so. Then the don't want to use a few registers. Then you do turn a few begin with the empty machine. And you never have a context switch. Ah. And you also, x86, oh. as the exception yeah. used with ARM, is that if you go on x86 and you do. Um, when you begin, then you check if you can use these registers in the first place. Because um, if you're running in the age and the age is using a few registers, then you may not be allowed to do so. But you don't, so I at this point in time, you don't know that any of this. You don't know where you're being called <coughs> from. That's the problem. Yes, but like say, six into kernel of few begin. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this is quite correct for two reasons. Empirically, the speed ups are like really obvious, like hundreds of megabits. And then uh, on LKML, there's currently a patch set to this improve this. Oh, you're doing the patch <laughs> set. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're speaking about speaking the future work. About, yes. Oh, okay. oh, to fix it. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I, oh, okay. Okay, so that makes more sense. I had it in the first place, and I first one. Oh, okay. Then um, they said do rid of, get rid of the uh, initialized place. Okay. So I got all rid of it. So I started with five patches. I'm now at 22 or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so I, I told you, once your patch set lands, we can probably nuke this. Yes, but what you were saying, that um, it extends to current threads, that's not true. It was in the, in the past. Huh. Basically, if you do your crypto in the current thread, no overhead at all. That's curious. Okay, I'll give that another look. My benchmarks totally disagree with that. But yeah, but around, I have no idea. Um, two years ago in February, because this is when the um, FPU emulation gets broken on x86. Right. Uh, that wasn't the case. Then we had eager FPU, and then it was the case that it was sort of this was for our current thread. No, it wasn't actually back then, because then the current thread never used. Let's continue with that later, maybe. Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> possibly forget that. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's useful, but hopefully it won't be with the events. <laughs> okay, um, but were this to be used in the encryption when you actually use the SIMD context, then you just call SIMD use. Um, but okay. Uh, so just uh, wrapping up, there's been um, kind of like a lot of noise around this patch set. Um, uh, I mean, for a couple reasons, um, we're, we're changing uh, a bit of the direction in in kernel crypto development. Um, got like stronger criteria for inclusion for code quality, um, which you know, if you're working on this as part of your job, it's kind of nice. Now you you know submit some you know assembly and it, it probably gets accepted. So no one's really you know looking at it that much. Um, and I can understand that, you know, I come along proposing maintain libzinc and now there are criteria. Now your job might get harder, you know. 
you know, blo block that from happening, and then you can keep an easier job. You know, okay, I, I get that. Um, it's also like a, a much different, kind of simpler approach to API design. Um, uh, and, you know, that's, that's a lot different than what's there now. Um, what's there now is, you know, in, invented mostly for IPsec, and it's kind of grown beyond that. Um, and of course, with, with ever trying to do kind of a newer, simpler thing, you have like lots of opinions on how that should work out. Um, and also, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm the, the commit message for Zinc is kind of very pretentious. You know, I'm this like new kid on the block coming in. Um, this is like a bit of a disturbance. Uh, and so there, I think there's been a, kind of like a lot of pushback uh, from that. Um, the initial patch set had a lot of generated assembly um, uh, from uh, from these, this CryptoGams code um, uh, from Andy Polnikov. We were just kind of including a generated assembly rather than his generator. Uh, but actually, we're replacing that now with the with the generators, uh, make it more easily tweakable. That was a good good review. Um, um, the initial patch set was like had all this together with WireGuard and one monster patch that was like insane. Um, and so, you know, we've uh, split this out now, kind of part of the process. Um, and there's been, you know, more and more calls for increasing granularity in this direction or that direction. So we've been uh, kind of trudging through the process for that. Um, the, it's new code in lib slash zinc, uh, and that entails we'll be maintaining this. Um, and there's always kind of a, a vacuum um, uh, you know, kind of like a political vacuum when it comes to acting new maintainers. Um, it's not as though I'm submitting this to an existing maintainer to be act. Uh, this will be uh, this will be a, a subdirectory with new maintainers. And so, um, you know, given that there's a little bit of resistance and changing how things work currently, and there's like a new maintainer, um, there there hasn't been anyone you know uh, in some position just steps forward and says, like, all right, we're doing this. It's in. We'll clean things up as we go. If necessary, you're the maintainer. You know, so th th there, there's a vacuum. So a lot of people kind of uh, come in, make a lot of noise and, and vacuums. Um, there, there, there have been, um, you know, like a, a lot of good review aspects. Uh, I think a V9 that will probably be out uh, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, uh, should address the, the last uh, the technical myths. Um, and so I think uh, mostly from here on out, it's uh, maybe a matter of organizational will to, to push it forward. Um, there's also this issue I found on, on the list of like, why doesn't it also do X? Uh, like, what about my pet feature? Can it have this knob? Because there's this one thing I really wanted. Can't we add this? Or, um, you know, with all those, there's, you know, probably good, good ideas for it, uh, good justifications. Yeah, we, you know, we could do that. We do it now. Should we do it later? Does it have to be in the initial submission? Well, yeah, I really want it, you know. And so that that kind of thing can go on uh, indefinitely. And um, uh, you know, given there's a bit of a vacuum because it's something with a new maintainer, there's not really uh, an authority right now to you know put the foot down and say like, no, uh, you know, enough with the knobs um, or the you know the feature request. Let's let's get in move forward. There's not that. There's just this you know kind of consensus discussion. So someone suggests something, it's you know maybe a good idea, and then it um, it keeps kind of pushing things back. Uh, Zinc stands for Zinc as in crypto. Um, uh, follows the naming scheme of uh, popular libraries like uh, sodium, uh, hydrogen, and so forth. Um, it also gives us a, a distinct uh, namespace from the existing crypto API, so that when you're using Zinc, you know that you're getting the just the the synchronous. Uh, uh, kind of raw crypto primitives, uh, is where as you're using uh, include crypto slash, then you're getting the, the asynchronous API and all the enterprise stuff. Um, but you know, uh, this kind of steps on on the toes of some people because it's like a new namespace, it's a new thing, and so that's been controversial. Um, I, I quipped early on that Zinc stood for uh, Zinc is not crypto slash, um, but like this. Uh, yeah, I like don't try and make jokes on the internet. I guess because <laughs> even if they're <laughs> even if they're lighthearted, like people really do not like this and, and just, like, deeply offended. So, zinc as in crypto, right? we're going with that now. Right? <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I guess it's a process. Uh, hopefully, V9 will you know probably get some some of the similar uh, uh, responses, but hopefully it'll also be. Uh, 
uh, improvement from V8. Um, and uh, we'll see if someone steps forward and says, uh, all right, enough, let's merge this, and then we can, we can move forward. Can I, can I say that now? Enough, let's merge this. All right, all right, we got Greg. <laughs> Excellent. So, but your, your V9 patch set is standalone in that it converts some existing users of some of the lib. It doesn't touch the crypto code, right? So actually, um, initially, the Zinc patch set didn't touch any of the crypto code because I didn't want to do that or like deal with that. But then they kept hounding me like, no, we want to see you convert the existing stuff right. into Zinc. And, and so I did that. That's in there. Okay. And I mean, that's like really boring and straightforward. I delete the existing code and then I have this like little stub that calls a function. Um, but I mean, as a standalone patch set, it is functional on its own to our users for it. Oh, yeah. So I have that and then I convert big keys to using it. Okay. Big uh, keys, I think, should be a good <laughs> reason anyway. Yeah, right. I right. mean, just seriously, that, that is, has so many problems that I think we could do how to sign off on that. Right. And, and then... Um, that should be... And then obviously WireGuard is using this. Right, I know WireGuard's uh, driving part. They might want to see that too. <laughs> Dave told me last night, said, WireGuard looks good, just get the script of stuff worked out at the end. So, so uh, I mean... Who, Dave? Which Dave? Miller. Okay. So, I mean, as a standalone cleanup for big keys alone, I think it's valid. And there's a, so many people trying to call the whatever. Right. And this was all their problems. Exactly. Yeah, and, so th and then once it's in, I can start moving the, the mess from lib into this and then cleaning up the million other places yes. that are, like, there's a lot of stuff I want to do that's just like hinging yeah, on I the agree. initial I agree. And, it's just, and, you, and we do have the vacuum problem of it. So if it's something a new under drivers or new under lib, who, who sucks it in? Who's true, right? Right. So, um, yeah, well, I think there was also a, uh, there was sort of a trap, right, which is some people said, we want to see that you're not adding new duplicate code, so uh, we want to see how you can obsolete the old uh, primitives that were in lib crypto. Right, which is and then there good. were other people who were saying, oh wait, as soon as you do this, you know, we need to make sure that it is at full parity um, in terms of, say, performance, right, right with the stuff that's in lib crypto. Uh, and that made it kind of a big bang patch kind of thing, right? And so yeah. that, I think, stalled you for a good month or so, at least. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, now there's this silly thing with, like, the cha-cha code where, like, Martin does have this cha-cha implementation that's in the crypto directory now, and uh, you know, now he's improved it to make it a little bit faster. Now it's, like, a little more competitive, but it doesn't support AVX512, and so... You know, there's still the, but like, the, yeah. this is, I mean, this know, is and stupid and, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> whichever way we can get it in, right, you've done the conversions, it would also be very easy for you to drop the last couple of patches that convert over the stuff that's in Lib Crypto so that it's just Zinc plus the big key cleanup. Sure, I would be fine with that. the battles it. of, you know, ripping out Cha-Cha and Lib Crypto and using the one in Zinc, right? There are multiple ways of playing it. I'm not sure if there's any one I, I right way, it's like which way actually Hubert well, allows us to make forward progress, right? Is Hubert here? No, I don't no, think no, so. He was in yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I would, I would yeah. love to rip out those top patches and I do that. I don't know about that. He doesn't have any major fixes. Yeah, I didn't think he cared. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's, he's, he's an absolute maintainer. Yeah, so I, I emailed yeah. him like a bunch, like, Herbert, you know, you want to look at this, can we talk? Like, you want to get on like Skype and we can actually, you know, face to face yeah. if that's easier? And he's like, no, I don't want to do that. But maybe like over the, the holiday coming up, I'll look at it. And then there's like two questions that are answered. So, I mean, he's kind of not really. Yeah, no, and that's, our, that's a development process problem we have. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think. So is your tree in um, the Linux Next uh, you know, is, is it in Linux next to this point? Uh, I don't think no. so. Um, if, you, if you don't think so, then it is. It's, uh, <laughs> so it's that's, <laughs> that's probably the next step, right? The next step is we should probably get it into yeah. Stephen Bothwell's I mean, Linux Max. It's on KBuild. And then, for, for uh, you know, just sort of make a statement that, you know, this is going into the next merge window, right? I mean, oh, sure. that's the organizational will part, assuming that you've cleared the last technical objections. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be a good way of doing it. And you get, did you get David's axe on the big key stuff? Uh, no, actually. I uh, tried to CC him in, on the discussion, but I think he. Is he yeah, here? He, I think he's here, though, right? Yeah, no, no, he's not. Dave Howells? No. Dave Howells? 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 Dave How
he's pretty reasonable, and the, that patch is pretty totally, yeah, basic. I, 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 I would be surprised if he had any problems. Yeah, I have one more question about how this works with the ciphers that come from third parties. How, like, we've always had a problem with the existing code. When we make changes, they don't get back to any upstream. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so help. Yeah so, so, yeah, so the cool thing about this is I'm uh, actually working with Andy Polikov where um, um, originally I had like, I had taken the output of his, of his assembly generator thing, this Perlasm stuff, um, and then tweaked it for the kernel and I just committed that and uh, this was not welcome because it was generated code even though I had worked on it manually. Um, uh, so now Andy and I have actually been uh, Andy Samuel and I have actually been uh, changing the generator to make kernel code. Yep. And so uh, that's going to be, there's already like a GitHub pull request that's going to be upstream in, in CryptoGams and OpenSSL. Where one, one thing I noticed there was actually, it's, it won't ever be real kernel code, I think. So the one thing that I stumbled over. No, I, but, it, but I it will. I spent a day trying to make it use the correct endianess conversion. Like the, uh, that, that was, I think, in WireGuard. Like when, when you call Wire, when WireGuard calls into it, there's something with endianess conversion. It's just what? you can't talk about it. Okay, because I mean it's assembly. So oh, no, oh, sorry, not, I, I didn't mean the assembly. I mean the, the generated C code. Oh, that's like as pure and foreign code as you can get. So with with but it's not quite kernel style. Ah, uh, yeah. So it's very it's very obvious C code and. It obviously does what you want it to do. It's, it just doesn't always look like someone would write it in the car. Yeah. So with the with the style for that, I'm working with those guys. Like, okay. I live in the same town, and I'll go to their office, and we'll sit down, and I'll be like, "Here is kernel code. Here's what you should, you know." So they're really receptive to that. Okay. Um, uh, but you're right with things like the endianness. Yeah, like I we want to use I our helpers it's just instead. Not realistic to ever get all the way there. We can get yeah. closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Getting closer is good. Like um, <laughs> NSS, the, the crypto library in Firefox, mm -hmm. uses it wholesale. Like they imported the whole crazy F star camel generator, and, but like the kernel is not going to do that, um, especially just for a little thing. So yeah, we, we get the generated C, we clean it up, and then it's, it's pretty good. Uh, I like to. So when you don't, we have examples in the tree of generated code that does not follow kerning style, and it's over time it's a pain because people start sending code examples to do it, and they ignore <laughs> the thing at the top that says "Do not touch this file," um, and then I get angry emails saying, "Why is that maintainer not taking the patches?" So if you can make it look like kernel coding style is good enough, please. I mean, I, I like it's 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 still pretty good code to read, and so I like to read it, and so I like it to look good. So I, I want to get it as close as possible. Yeah, I mean, I, I do it's read it like and think through it. And why would anybody write this? I, mean, I know exactly what it does. It's very readable. And, well, but it's like that's crypto well, code. Also, <laughs> that's crypto code. In the same yeah. way that like the chess world will analyze how the machines play, like ooh, that was a cool move. The machine generator, like it's cool yes. to look at yeah. the yeah. generated code and. <laughs> Yeah, so we're in the middle of the break, so okay. maybe we okay. should let people go who want to go, because I think for now, uh, you know, we're all developing.